Hi everyone, my name is Saber Papoli and I'm the owner and founder of Hoof Falls and Footfalls. And today I'm gonna to be doing an interview with Dr. Rebecca Waragoss. And she has recently pulled together some really neat information and research on equine facilitated psychotherapy as it relates to female veterans that are struggling with PTSD. So um, thank you, Dr. Wargoss, for, for joining in on this interview. And um, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Sabra, for inviting me to be part of the interview. Um, so I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, um, and currently I own my own private practice. Um, it's called Eudaimonia Connections Counseling Services for Mental Health Treatment and Transpersonal Wellness. Uh, the shorter version of it is Eudaimonia Connections Counseling Services. Okay. Um, at the moment, it's office-based therapy, but eventually my plans are to start my own EFE program, hopefully within the year. Um, and I specialize in um, transpersonal psychology, which is the combination of holistic practices and integrating mind, body, spirit into the work that I do. Um, and eudaimonia stands for the highest state of well-being. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's an odd word, but, but it fit perfectly with my goals uh, for what, um, what I enjoy to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then in terms of um, the EFP world, I, um, I have certifications with PATH International. Um, so currently, I'm a therapeutic writing instructor and an equine specialist in mental health and learning. Um, I did do a gala a long time mm -hmm. ago, but I just haven't renewed um, the certifications. Um, but at the moment, I'm okay with working through the past, um, past certifications at this time. Great. Um, and how, so how did you get involved with the equine assisted activities and therapies industry and, you know, kind of come across the certifications and then now pair it with your, your career? Yeah. Um, so I've always loved horses. I, I have that horse gene where I was just a super horse crazy little girl and, um, you know, read all, you know, read Saddle Club and read you know, Black Beauty, read all the books possible growing up, Black Stallion. Um, but my family, I'm the youngest of 10. And so my family was not able to allow me to specialize in, in horseback riding for a while. So it wasn't until um, I was in college and, um, and I rode, you know, a bit growing up, but mm -hmm. I wasn't able to like get super involved in horses until I was older and could afford it on my own, um, which is fine. So, um, so I believe in, after I graduated undergrad, I was working in the banking world um, and I liked it to a certain point and, but I realized that it just wasn't a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to really help people, not just with finances, but in a quality way. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go back to grad school in 2010 um, at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. It's in Palo Alto, uh, California. Mm -hmm. um, they've now since changed their name, um, but that's what it was originally. Um, and I actually didn't even know there was an EAP, EFP world yet, um, but I wanted to be able to combine working in mental health with horses. Yeah. Um, and so it, it was through that interest and in acquisition that I found out, um, I would say probably within the first couple of months that there was equine assisted psychotherapy. And so I've gotten excited about that since. And, um, and I started doing, I think in 2011 was when I started doing independent research mm -hmm. in EAP uh, for an organization called Victory Ranch. They were in San Jose, California, um, and they had a kids and horses education program and it was at-risk kids that would come from the county mm -hmm. um, and learn about horses and it was kind of like a um, they would come for 10 sessions learn about horses the last two they would ride um, and so I was just kind of helping to research um, you know efficacy or outcome more from a uh, um, you know, just more to see if like it was working. It wasn't like a big study necessarily. Um, and it wasn't, um, uh, you know, it has some quantitative pieces to it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like an experimental design. But mm -hmm. I did that for a couple of years uh, before I knew anything about research, <laughs> like how to do it appropriately. Right. So I had to like learn on my own. So it was pretty interesting um, until I got into the PhD program and then I got really good 
good training and all of yeah. that stuff. But um, so I kind of I've been involved since 2010, um, interested in the practice of it, but also the research of it, um, because it became quite apparent that it was not very well known. Mm-hmm. Um, and that there were a lot of pathological, you know, people like saying it works, but there wasn't a lot of evidence. Um, mm. so I really wanted to, that's what inspired me to go into the PhD program after I graduated with my master's in counseling psychology, uh, to, to try to become a researcher so I could help the field at BFP and EAP. Um, yeah. That's awesome. That's really great. So that, that kind of leads into then, um, this really great dissertation that you pulled together and the title of it, and I'm going to read it off so I don't mess it up, <laughs> is <Sure. laughs> Versus Healing the Wounded Warrior, a Qualitative Inquiry of Equine Facilitated Psychotherapy in Treating Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder for Female Veterans. So can you tell us about your dissertation? How, what made you choose you know, that specific topic versus another population? And, and you know, how did this kind of all come about? Sure. Um, yeah, at first I was quite ambitious. I thought that I would be able to do a controlled study and experimental mm-hmm. design and, and then have follow up. And so I'd started out trying to have it be, you know, uh, before, during and after and, um, you know, have uh, participants fill out uh, symptoms inventories every week. And like, I was trying to get it to be evidence-based, right? Or mm-hmm. try to have it be an efficacy study in the beginning. Um, but it was quickly apparent how challenging that can be. Um, because in the research world, in order to have statistical significance, you have to have an N of 100 or more, an mm-hmm. N meaning participants. And so it was very challenging to consider how the heck could I incorporate 100 people mm-hmm. when at the place I was working at, um, called Dream Power Horsemanship, uh, in Gilroy, California. And that's where mm-hmm. I did my uh, marriage and family therapist intern training, um, partly. Um, and then also learned how to do equine facilitated psychotherapy with my supervisor, Martha McNeil, Mm -hmm. um, who's also an LMFT and certified in PATH, and it's a premier accredited PATH center. Mm -hmm. So I learned, you know, for uh, about four years there um, about EFP and all of that, but, and uh, she would allow me to kind of use her facilities to try to conduct my research, but it was very challenging to see how can I recruit people and then how can I make it um, you know, with very little funding, little time, right? And so, um, so to kind of go back a little bit as to, I always knew that I wanted to do my research in EFP. Like I knew it was going to be about that and the treatment of it in mental health world. Um, in terms of the population, I wasn't quite sure yet what, who I wanted to work with. Um, I had a feeling that it would be with women. Um, and, and I feel like it just, I just kind of felt drawn that that would be, you know, the gender that I would want to work with, um, partly because it, it fascinated me and still does that so many women um, seem to be connected to horses. Um, not to say men can't either, um, but very often at least where I've been to so many of the staples is all women, or mm-hmm, predominantly right. women. Um, and it just seems that, you know, that is fascinating. You know, most of the interns were all women. So, so it was just like, what is it about that? So I wanted to kind of experiment with that too, if that's possible. Um, so what ended up happening was, was that uh, Dream Power Horsemanship had a Wounded Warrior program. And so we worked with veterans in our local community. Um, some of them would come weekly for group therapy where they would talk and then ride or work with horses that they paired up with. Um, and that could be, you know, extenuating. They can come, you know, as often as they wanted. Um, and then there were also sometimes programs where they would come just for like a weekend. Like there'd be like a big um, family event happening or um, a couple therapy thing, or there's a variety of things that were offered to the veteran community for free, um, because it was funded through grants. Um, so that being said, I will never forget, because I helped, um, co-lead, um, quite a few of the veteran groups, um, while we were there and helped to, uh, somewhat be the therapist um, independently for some of the veterans when they would pair off with the horses, but it wasn't really any kind of intensive therapy. It was just more kind of relaxed. If they wanted to talk, was great. If not, that was fine. Um, it was more that they had a connection and felt comfortable and could relax while they were there. So it wasn't like super uh, intense kind of my, uh, um, mental health treatment, so to yeah. speak. Uh, so I never forget, I was sitting with, um, I think we had just started the women's veteran um, 
a group that we were starting to offer. And, um, and that day, I think there's like six veteran women who had come out um, and I was sitting in a circle, you know, and people were going around introducing themselves. Um, and they were women from the ha- different ages, um, had served in different times mm-hmm. in the military, but every single one of them revealed that they had military sexual trauma, mm. MST, every single one. And I will never forget the impact of that. And, um, and just, it just was like, wow that's who I'm going to study. That's it right there. Ah. This, that's it. That's incredible. You know, that's, that's awful. <laughs> that's yeah. horrible. But you know, that's, I want to hear their voices. And I became really inspired to be, um, you know, help advocate, be an ally, whatever I can um, with this. Um, and what I know now from, you know, researching and stuff is that one in four um, uh, female veterans have MSD usually sexual assault, but it can also be sexual harassment um, mm-hmm. and all the other uh, qualifiers that go into MST. So that's when narrowed down to female veterans. Um, and then that's who I chose to, to recruit, participate in my study. Okay. Yeah. So very kind of a, a personal connection there of, of experience that had led to the population group. Um, so with, with the MST, is that usually kind of comorbid with the PTSD then, or is that um, so you, you usually see both of those then together in the, the military, um, the female veterans. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and when I first started recruiting, I was looking at women veterans, but I was assuming to be combat veterans. Like it, it was like the women inspire me with, you know, this is who I want to work with, but I didn't like focus it on MST and I don't necessarily state that, you know, like in my questions. Um, so I was looking at just military related PTSD, you know, PTSD that they may have acquired in uh, their time of service. I was assuming usually from deployment, right? So my, my civilian assumption was like most people that they get PTSD from combat, right? Or they, or just, um, just being part of an, uh, um, maybe like a harsh environment or there was a variety of things that cleared up to PTSD. Um, but it was through, um, through my research, like studying the literature review. Um, and then when I started offering the interviews, which is how I collected the majority of my data, mm-hmm. um, all of them were willing to reveal, you know, that they actually had, um, their PTSD was from MST incidents. Okay. And so um, there, I think there was one, there was only, so I had 10 participants. Uh, one participant, her, uh, her PTSD was from combat, mm-hmm. from not necessarily that she was fighting in it, but she was like uh, a military, t- uh, sorry, a, mil- <laughs> a medical tech. So she okay. was like helping to serve people, you know, uh, heal or help serve people that were wounded. Um, and then that was became very, extremely traumatic over time. And then that's how she developed more combat related PTSD. Um, but the other nine did not describe combat experiences. Some of them were deployed, um, but didn't serve in like active um, areas or hotspots. Um, but they, they had either been raped once or multiple times in the military. And that's how they developed PTSD. And so that's why I changed it from combat to military related PTSD. Because mm-hmm. um, as far as I know, um, based on their stories and what they're willing to share during their interviews, was that they didn't have PTSD before. Mm-hmm. Um, it was during their time of service and then mm-hmm. afterwards that they develop um, PTSD. Okay. On that. Mm-hmm. So you had, so you had 10 individuals that um, volunteered to participate in, in this study for your research. And what, um, based off of the interviews and all the data that you gathered, what was the, the outcome that you found of the impact of these equine, um, the equine facilitated psychotherapy on these individuals? Yeah, so I, um, so my, my main instrument for gathering data was the interviews. Um, so they were semi-structured where I had some questions available, but mostly it was free form. They could share, you know, whatever they wanted within the time that we had. Um, and uh, so because, it, it, oh, and then um, the, the method for my dissertation was uh, qualitative. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just going to be pulling from the interviews, thematic themes, or thematic analysis. Um, so I've thrown out at some point trying to get quantitative or mixed methods. I was like, 
a good dissertation is a done dissertation. So I kind of just narrowed it down to that. And um, so through, so after I collected all the 10 interviews and they were transcribed, then I had to go through it and, and pull out the themes. Um, and so it was a very, really long process. <laughs> I had to redo it several times. It took mm -hmm. a very long time to finally get what I have, um, which is good and bad. <laughs> bad because it took a longer time than I thought it would. It was very challenging, mm -hmm. um, but good because I feel like the results um, that came through the outcome really matched, I think, really well with what the women were sharing. So I pulled a total of like, uh, I grouped it into six themes just so it kind of made some sense. Um, but there were uh, 33 major themes found wow. with about 11 that narrowed down to, um, to very specific outcomes that had five or more participants dating these things. Um, so it was a lot that was pulled and in my um, results chapter, it's, it's all kind of laid out and then descriptive. So it's kind of describe like, what does that mean? You know, what did they say? And then excerpts of quotes from the interviews are provided. Um, so it kind of all kind of breaks down and makes more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then in my discussion chapter is where I write about, you know, what does that mean or the interpretation of my findings. Mm -hmm. um, so the 11, I'll just kind of read off real quick the 11 yeah, ones, uh, the, those ones. Um, so what was discovered uh, to be the most significant themes, uh, common to five or more, include emotional discomfort with the horse, which, uh, which means that there was initially fear, you know, mm -hmm. fear, anxiety working with the horses, um, but eventually that kind of dissipated over time as they worked with the horses. Um, spiritual experience with the horse, experience of safety with the horse, visual contact with the horse, emotional connection with the horse, beneficial impact of therapy, increased connection with others, Reduced anxiety, reduced withdrawal, EFP advocacy for others, and delayed awareness of PTSD. Okay. And can you, can you explain that last one, the delayed awareness of PTSD? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was, um, that was actually a very interesting finding that I was not really expecting to find, but it's where women after like post-military, after they had served, either they, and all of them were honorably discharged, by the way, um, but whenever they left their time of service in the military, they didn't know they had PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, and PTSD symptoms, and they could have other symptoms too, like major depression or a generalized anxiety mm -hmm. disorder, or they could have had other things going on or OCD or whatever, but I mostly focused on PTSD. Um, and they didn't know that they were symptomatic for it. Some for 10 to 15 years after that wow. kind of service. Um, most of them d didn't, I mean, because right when they were out, they didn't, most of them did not go straight to therapy. So it was delayed awareness of it, like not knowing that they had it until um, their lives became so much, like they had coped on their own and their resiliency was just kind of breaking down um, and they needed support. Um, either because they were using too much uh, many substances or alcohol um, or they just were not having a good quality of life and they needed mental health treatment mm -hmm. um, or loved ones were saying you need to go get support <laughs> you know something you're not doing well um, and then they would go in and then they would find out they had PTSD and they go oh I didn't know I had that um, so that was a huge I thought that I thought that was pretty significant mm -hmm. that majority had that experience um, and it is true I mean it takes a while after a traumatic incident for it to be even qualified as PTSD mm -hmm. as the month or longer but these some of these women were years later mm -hmm. so that was huge and I write about that about how important that is for uh, mental health clinicians to um, have really good diagnostic and assessment like really making sure you're screening appropriately um, and same thing with the military like really and, I, and they're doing a lot better now with this mm -hmm. but just really making sure that you're helping to screen for this um, because it can become very, very, very debilitating, uh, mm -hmm. for some people. Yeah. Like PTSD symptoms. And were these women that participated in the study, were they all part of the same program or were they pulled from different, uh, programs? Yeah. And so, uh, I, so my recruitment criteria was very narrow. <laughs> so it took me a long time to actually find participants that met my criteria. Um, so my criteria was that they had to, it was national, 
So just throw that out there is national for anywhere in the United States. Um, and predominantly English speaking, you know, so they could understand mm -hmm. the interviews and stuff. Um, but that they had to have served in the military from 1990 the present mm -hmm. um, and that was just to kind of narrow down the Middle East conflicts it wasn't mm -hmm. trying to be so exclusionary of Vietnam War veterans and other veterans or um, but just 1990 the present just having some kind of a cutoff um, and had to have participated in an equine facilitary facilitated psychotherapy treatment within the past three years so it could have been you know past and then they're talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just to try to, to get some summits of experiences and, and, and to try to, um, you know, see if even after three years, how they were feeling too. So it's just kind of, they could have still been doing it at the time of the interviews, but just trying to cap it at no longer mm -hmm. than, no, uh, no longer than three years. Okay. Um, and they had to have been a military veteran um, and they had to have a, um, diagnosis of PTSD from a either primary care psychiatrist or mental health professional okay. um, and, that, and that I had and that was verified too uh, with okay. release of information forms so um, I recruited everywhere all over the US um, and so um, in my demographics part of my dissertation which is in the methodology section for a little bit kind of like halfway towards the end um, it, it lets you know like the areas where they come from um, but they um, they were in multiple locations in the United States, some on the East Coast, um, some in the South, and then some in California. Um, in terms of the programs, uh, they had participated in a variety of types of programs. Um, most of them were either PATH International Accredited Centers or EGALA mm -hmm. model um, programs. Um, some were, had also equine facilitated learning in it, um, but all of them were led by mental health professionals. Okay. Um, with, the, with the idea of helping to manage PTSD symptoms, um, which okay. is kind of the idea. Um, and then however long they were participating in the program just depended. So some just went to a retreat and mm -hmm. had that experience. Um, some went to like a you know, step-by-step -step program where they could go for 10 sessions and then it would stop um, or they could do ongoing. Some were able to continue to do that. Um, and majority of them had to stop going, not because they didn't want to, was because funding ran out mm -hmm. or because it wasn't being offered um, again or it wasn't being offered um, locally to them so quite a few of them were like there's nothing near me so they would have to go to the retreats which can be expensive time right. consuming and for people that have PTSD and at the level of some of these women did it's very hard to even leave their houses mm -hmm. so to expect them to fly you know somewhere or drive somewhere is very was very difficult uh, for majority of them. Okay. Well, that's really, you know, interesting that it's the, the results that you gathered of you, those 11 different common points that were present in five or more of those individuals that were spread across the United States. That's, that was really interesting to see you know, all those pop up that it's not just, you know, because of this program, it's because of this interaction with the horses that these common things are, are coming up. Um, so can you quickly explain, um, for those of us that aren't quite as familiar with research, can you explain the difference between qualitative and, uh, quantitative data and why you chose the qualitative over quantitative for your study? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so in research, there's like three main methodologies and methods is how you design and set up your research. Um, it includes your research question, it includes um, your topic of interest, um, and the participants or the population that you're wanting to invite to be part of your study. Um, those three are going to be quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods. Uh, mixed methods is both. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a combination of quantitative um, and qualitative, and then both of the analysis are part of the data write-up um, and then discussion. Um, so when I first started out, I was going to be really ambitious and do mixed methods, <laughs> which is going to have quantitative and qualitative. Um, quantitative is, is classically known using surveys. Mm -hmm. So people will fill out a survey, and then the number of responses is used to do 
use with statistical analysis to gather uh, statistical significance or not, or there's a whole step-by-step -step procedure in how to do statistics. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will plug it into um, a program like Excel um, and, then, and get their results that way. Um, and that tends to be the golden standard for majority of research. Um, in psychology, in the medical world, it, it, most journals are going to only publish quantitative research that showed or closely showed statistical significance. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with a number, it has to do with like if it's 0.5 or higher mm -hmm. um, of this probability. Um, and then quantitative is very, very picky. Like they want to make sure that your results are clean, that you have um, like really considered um, what they call uh, validity, like mm -hmm. internal validity, um, which includes, you know, are you sure you're really getting what you get? Or is there a research bias? Or, you know, well, what happens if this happened? Or how are you sure that you had it? So there's a lot of validity checks in that. And mm -hmm. then there's external validity, which is your results. And then if you do have statistical significance, is it going to be generalizable? Like, is it going to be able to be general for the rest of the population? Or is it very specific? Um, and I think what the goals with that are that you, if you can demonstrate that you had significance, um, is that it can benefit other people, right? Because you want it to, in some way, be helpful, I guess. Why else, why else would you do it? Uh, <laughs> you're hoping to have some benefit in something. Um, and... Um, and then if it's going to work with that population. Um, and um, so there's very, it's very uh, structured. There's a process to it. There's so many different ways to do quantitative, but it can, usually it's surveys that people are collecting. Mm -hmm. um, for experimental designs, you have a control group and an experimental group. Um, and the experimental group is what you do something to. So that would have been like a veteran's head comedy participate in EFP, they would have been experimental. Control is something that people that you don't do anything with. So they could be people that just have regular therapy and then you see and then you and then you have them take the same instruments, which could be the same surveys. It could also which can include um, symptom inventories, you know, like how are you feeling today? It, have you noticed any changes? Things like that. Um, it can also be observational. So research can be a uh, researcher can be observing and then have a checklist you know, very specific of what they're looking at. Um, and then they can quantify that. Um, so those that the, the ex, um, experiential ones or the efficacy ones want the two control groups, because um, ideally you want something to happen to the experimental group. Mm -hmm. You want that to have like great changes and you're like, yes, it worked, it was amazing. Right. Um, and you want the control group to not have done as well. <laughs> <laughs> because if they both do well, right, because someone's having regular therapy, but they're having EFP and they both do well, mm -hmm. okay, then, so what, right. right? So you want it to matter in some way. Right. Uh, so, so not therapists, but researchers have to be really careful they're not manipulating data. Mm -hmm. Like, there's not a lot of research bias to want, you know, things more to be done over here in the <laughs> So, uh, so that's the quantitative part. And then uh, mixed methods is, is a lot of that, but including some interviews. Mm -hmm. um, so classically, there could be maybe 100 participants fill out a survey. Um, and there's maybe um, five or 10 that you might pull from that, that you either liked what they responded to, or you did a randomized check, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of randomized and pulled a certain a number of people from it. Um, and then and then you offer interviews. So then you would just do an interview and ask a little more detail. You know, why did you ask that? You know, what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then you would do a qualitative analysis right up of that. And then that would be your mixed methods. Um, so for qualitative over here, mm -hmm. qualitative is all about the, uh, the personal experiences of someone with what they experience. It's extremely subjective. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't matter if there were statistical significance or not. You want it, it's about allowing people to share their lived experience of something. Um, and then within qualitative, there's a variety of ways to design it and write it up. Um, and qualitative has done a good job with trying to um, make it feel like it's going to be um, like a standardized. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a specific way to do it um, because in the scientific world, there's kind of a lot of um, 
devaluing a qualitative mm -hmm. because it wasn't as stringent as the quantitative over here. But qualitative, you're gonna actually get the stories from people. You can actually mm -hmm. get like why they went, what did they really experience? It's not just about surveys, like marking off something. You're getting really uh, quality mm -hmm. um, information. So in, in certain fields like transpersonal psychology, um in humanistic psychology some of these other ones that are really more people centered mm -hmm. um, they want to hear those stories and so you're going to see a lot more dissertations that in those fields that are qualitative um, that are really looking at what someone's experience was if they had a spiritual experience well what is that you can't really get that in quantitative you mm -hmm. can try um, you, know, you can try to hook people up and, and see if, if their body changes, if they're having a spiritual experience. Um, but in qualitative, their stories helps with that and, and provides information. Um, so qualitative is, so in my research, you know, I was really able to get amazing information. Mm -hmm. It was really impactful. A lot of the stories, um, you know, were very heavy. And I write about that in my dissertation about my process with that and, and, and how, you know, difficult it was to hear the stories, but then also how lovely it was to hear um, their experiences with the horses, the connections they felt, the changes they, they went through. Some had powerful changes with the horses, mm -hmm. like transformative experiences where it eliminated their panic attacks entirely. Wow. It's huge, yeah. you know, and, and they felt connected. And so, there, so in my results section, it's really cool to kind of see and hear that, hear the actual words um, of, of what that was like for them. Um, and, then, um, and then afterwards, you know, after someone has done qualitative, they can, they can turn it into a quantitative later on. So it can be like a pilot study or it can be an mm -hmm. introduction to something. Um, and then you can try to narrow it down and then see if you can do it just as a quantitative, um, sorry, as a um, survey type research or design into experiment, um, which would be more of the efficacy studies where you have the two groups. Okay. Um, yeah. No, thank you for, for explaining those, the different, um, you know, the three different ways. Cause uh, I, you know, I've learned about research and in, in my college studies, but I know a lot of the instructors that are out there are those that are interested in the research that's being gathered. You know, they see qualitative, quantitative mixed method and don't necessarily understand the difference between those. And so I think you did a very good job of, you know, explaining the the pros and the cons of both and how it's gathered and when you're reading these studies that have those little keywords of what type of study it was um you know helping them better understand how that data was gathered and what that means so thank you for sharing that that was um very informative so with this study so how long did it take you to gather all the data and pull it together and and go from you know starting point to, to end point um a long time, <laughs> a long time, way longer than I ever thought it would. Um, so I started my PhD program in 2012. Uh -huh. uh, it was supposed to be advanced, uh, um, an advanced accelerated program because I already had my master's degree. So it's supposed mm -hmm. to be in PhD school for three years. That did not happen. I was there for eight years. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and the first two years were learning about research, mm -hmm. um, and then the last year was about writing about your mini proposal, narrowing down what you wanted to do, um, and then get your proposal ready, and then advance to PhD candidacy, which allows you and gives you permission to start recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that is already two to three years. So there's that, but life has a way of coming in and interesting <laughs> stuff. So I had a lot of stuff that came up, uh, unfortunately, in my life. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people had passed away and just health issues, just stuff that kept coming up. And so part of that got pushed back. Um, the other part of it was was that, I, so I started collecting, um, I passed my, my PhD candidacy, which allowed me to start recruiting um, towards the end of, I believe it was 2000, uh, 15. So mm -hmm. 2016, I believe, I started recruiting from like April all the way until about January. Wow. Um, so it's about six months of recruiting. And this is the part that makes research long. So mm -hmm. sometimes you don't know how long it's going to take to get participants to sign up. Um, and especially it depends like how, how narrowed your criteria is for them. Um, so I was fortunately able to get 10. And so in qualitative research, one to three can be good enough because you're getting like really detailed case studies. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you want 15 to 20 though, 
to get what is called saturation, which mm -hmm. is where you get just enough information that you probably don't need more, because then it's going to start to be the same, kind of the theory on that. Um, so I was grateful with 10. <laughs> like, thank you. Uh, yeah. And then um, there's a whole process that was set up with that, and which yeah. I describe in my methods. But, um, you know, once they were screened and able to be part of it, um, then we set up their interviews and then um, were able to do that. So I collected all 10 interviews, and by, the, uh, by I think, by 2017. Um, so from, like, March 2017 until probably 2019 was the, the next step, which is the data analysis. Wow. So it's where you have to transcribe everything and then do, uh, try to pull themes from it. Um, and then there's checks and balances with that. And so because I was a beginning researcher, this is the first time I've, you know, had this much data to work with. Um, I had to redo my entire data analysis twice. Oh, wow. So the final result is the third time, third time's a charm. Um, <laughs> had to redo my entire results chapter oh. once. So this one's the second one. So it's like it's like you think you're you're done, you're ready to go, and then my chair or my methods guy would go, nope, nope, you uh. gotta redo that. So you try not to have a mini breakdown. But <laughs> so there there's a lot of it. And right now it's great. I'm got and I'm grateful, right? Because it's it's a lot better than it would have been. because mm -hmm. uh, it's just refining and refining and refining it. So it took a while. Um this is why I think, you know, researchers work in teams. <laughs> so you'll see on research studies there's more than one author. Uh because then you can divide and separate the work. Um whereas with PhD students they they have to do it all themselves. Uh, for the most part. So yeah, it was, it was it definitely took a long time. Uh, I finally finished everything um, beginning of this year. Okay. So I finally was able to, um, I had my doctoral defense, um, if it was in March. Okay. So just recently, I'm now a doctor after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why it took so long, but it did. <laughs> well, that's awesome that you, you know, pushed through all those all the obstacles that came up and even though it took longer than planned that you, um, you know, pushed through all that and then came out with this awesome, um, you know, research and where, where are you seeing this research go in the future? How do you hope this, you know, changes or impacts the equine assisted activities and therapies industry? Mm -hmm. Are you planning on doing anything else with this or a different type of study? Where, where do you see things going in the future? Yeah. And, um, so, to start off going into that question or questions is that what guided me to kind of keep powering through mm -hmm. during all those setbacks and wanting to give up were to be able to share the voices of my participants, to be yeah. able to share the voices of women mm -hmm. and their experiences um, and, and what their connections with horses were like. So that was like, you know, my beacon, my, my guiding light, that was like, I can't give up on them. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for now, now that it's finally done, is now I have the opportunity to share, you know, to share what their experiences were. Um, and uh, when I announced, you know, this is done, and I was sharing it on Facebook and some yeah. of the groups, which is how I met you, was that, you know, this is it. I wasn't trying to necessarily self-promote, but I thought people might be interested. Yeah. Because I know, I felt that the data was actually really fascinating, and mm -hmm. there was stuff I learned from it that I didn't know. Um, and I figured, and that was the point, right, was to kind of help share it and, um, and be able to get the information out there. Um, and, and so people, the horse world went nuts. The mental health world was like, oh, that's nice. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> horse people were like, oh, yeah. yeah. So as of right now, my dissertation has been shared 380 times. It's been emailed to people. Majority of them, I have no idea who they are. <laughs> <laughs> like strangers, which is fine, but it's been really cool, and it's opened up the dialogue for conversations. So I've met so many amazing people um, with just sharing, and um, some people are like, "Just thank you for the, uh, you know, the dissertation." They read it, they, they make comment on it. But a lot of people also were having discussions, so we're talking about it. People are um, interested in it. They're they're excited that it's um, for the veteran community because mm -hmm. a lot of people work with veterans. Um, and they do need a lot of support and they need, um, you know, reintegration to civilian lives for women that have had MSD or even men, they need healing from that. And that's mm -hmm. a long road to recovery. Um, and so, um, I think just having that, that open dialogue of what can come next, 
mm -hmm. from the dissertation would be great. So there's, you know, I'm thinking of other ways that I can um, extrapolate on my dissertation and see, you know, where that might go. Um, whether that goes into a book or narrowed down to a journal article, there's certain more things that can be done in that area. But that being said, like I, um, now that I am a, a doctor, I have a PhD, um, I can sit on, you know, dissertation committees now. I can be principal researcher, mm -hmm. um, you know, head of research, head of designing it. it. It's opening up more opportunities for me to help lead things or co-lead um, and participate in additional research, which really is fascinating and excites me. So I love doing that. I love, uh, I'm kind of nerdy with research. I love talking about it. I like figuring out how to make it work. I'm not a numbers person though, no. so I will pass on any quantitative results <laughs> to someone over here who loves numbers. <laughs> so, hey, that's why we work at teams because there's all sorts, you know, everyone has their strengths. Yeah. Um, but I love it. I, I love figuring out how can we make this work? You know, how, how can we, I think we could do it. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just being very clear about how it's done. Um, and, and trying to figure out standardization and, and in the ESP world and how can we, um, help make it accessible in the scientific community and mm -hmm. the reason why that matters like why why do we care so much about research we know it works we love EFP we love horses we love helping people we see the results why do we care about the research part um, for several things um, one is because if it becomes understood that it actually might be working mm -hmm. it can go from alternative to mainstream therapy if it goes that way, then it's more likely that insurance companies will pick it up and pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's more likely that it will be shared in other um, mental health uh, organizations like the APA or the AMFT or, you know, other other counseling organizations might be talking about it more. You know, like everyone's excited about EMDR, mm -hmm. right? But what happens if they're excited about EFT? right and they do conferences on it so it, it's it's increasing the knowledge of it and accepting that this can be utilized mm -hmm. um that's huge um partly because for funding right i mean a lot of people that have yeah. efp programs it is extremely expensive so if they can legitimize it there's chances are that they'll be able to get more grants more funding mm -hmm. and from other scientific organizations um, that might like NIH or you know other big organizations APA might go yeah let's drop a couple thousand or ten thousand mm -hmm. twenty thousand on this and let's research it right so yeah. it it the more um, well known it becomes uh, the more that it's uh, good researchers done and and other uh, um, picky researchers go oh yeah that actually does look good mm -hmm. <laughs> then there's so much more opportunity that can come through um, of course the other part of it is is the outreach being able to have uh, increased accessibility um, for veterans, for other mental health um, clients, mm -hmm. to be able to have access to this. Because a lot of them, at least in my research and what I've known a little bit before this, is that they don't know what the heck EFP is. Right. Like, what is that? I don't even know what that was until someone told me. Right. And so once they knew and they had the opportunity to participate in it, then they could experience that amazing um, you know, experiential treatment they're mm -hmm. able to have that way. So it's, it's so important that, that there's access for people, that they're aware of it, they know how to find it, and they can afford it, you mm -hmm. know, or find ways to participate in it. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a big part of it, too, um, because just as it, much as it's expensive uh, for facilitators to run these programs, it can be mm -hmm. expensive for clients to pay for them. Yeah. Because um, the average out-of-pocket rate is probably 120, 150 per session. Mm -hmm. um, that can be about the same for private practice, though. Like for my private practice, I charge 145 mm -hmm. for individuals, 160 for couples. So sure, right? There's that, and that's based off education, my experience. You know where I feel like I mm -hmm. would have a good fit. Um, but a lot of people can't afford that. Right. Um, and most people have insurance, mm -hmm. which will cover that. So. Right. Um, yeah, so just kind of kind of going off on that part, but that's why um, where I hope to go is to help participate in that, participate in those conversations, um, provide my my opinions, you know, and ways mm -hmm. it can go, but also learn from other people. Um, there's been so many great people that um, I've met that have come forward and have great ideas for other research or, you know, learn from other people as well, because mm -hmm. I don't know everything <laughs> at all. Um, and so to collaborate with people from which is awesome all over the world, mm -hmm. all these other EFP, EAP happy people is really cool. 
it's, yeah. it's very exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I hope I answered your questions, by the no, way. That, yeah, that was great. <laughs> of, of where you want it to go and, and not only just where you want it to go, but, but why? Cause I think, um, you know, those of us that are, are not on the, the funding side of things or the research side, it's, you know, yeah, we see that it works. We know it works. We were, you know, boots on the ground. We're seeing the impact it has on the people we're working with. And we're like, well, why in the world can't we secure funding for this? Why is it not working? You know, why can't we get these um, organizations to buy in? And it's because that, that research component is just not quite there yet. And, you know, I remember when um, EMDR was kind of one of those, like, wait, what's that? What, you know, what, what's that? How, do, how, is it, how does it work? And, um, you know, kind of more newer, especially in the military community. And now it's become much more well-known. It's much more recognized. And so for you to want, you know, EFP to follow that same route is, is great, um, you know, and, and secure that funding and make it more accessible and make it more well-known and better understood. Because I think everything in our industry on the outside kind of gets jumbled together. You know, it's all um, equine facilitated psychotherapy is sometimes seen the same as adaptive or therapeutic riding or, you know, the horse therapy or whatever the terms are. So, um, you know, for more well-worded research to go out there um, is great. It's wonderful. So yeah, no, I, you answer that very well. <laughs> so Thank thanks. you. And, and what I would like to say real quick about the terminology <laughs> is that if you look at just regular psychology, there's tons of terminology to describe something. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of different names for interventions and stuff. And part of that is okay. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't think it's possible to be able to, to narrow everything down to a specific term. You mm -hmm. can definitely try, you know, maybe pick your top five. Mm -hmm. And then just the only thing that really matters is that there's a clear definition of what that means. Like yes. you break it down, yeah. right? So as long as it's very clear, of what that is and what that means I think it's okay the variety of terms that are used mm -hmm. as long as it's not 150 terms mm -hmm. <laughs> that's too much but if there's still an equine horse whatever that does right then and then I think I think that part's okay because there's so many there's so many different ways to work with horses and different mm -hmm. ways that people want to have adapted mental health treatment mm -hmm. um, and and I think it's hard to try to to narrow people down into a specific method mm -hmm. you know Gala has done a good job with that mm -hmm. you know by narrowing it down you do this all the time mm -hmm. um, but but in order for there to be adaptability and for it to work with clients because not all clients respond to treatment the same way right uh, then, you know, I think it's okay if there's some wiggle room in terminology. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. I mean, there's psychotherapy, there's mental health. I mean, it's the same thing. Yes. But the, <laughs> right? the, so. I think in your study, because you did mention that um, all of the, the programs that these uh, veterans have participated in, they were led by a mental health professional, correct? Okay. So just the... Um, and I work more on the recreational side of things versus therapy of sometimes there's that overlap of recreational programs being assumed to be therapy when there's not a mental health professional or a physical health professional involved. And so, you know, making that, and again, your study was very clear on, you know, the program was run by a mental health professional. So it was, it was mental health and it wasn't, you know, a, a recreational program that got morphed into to uh, therapy, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, no, I agreed though that there's, you know, multiple different ways and that you can't just pigeonhole people into only, only groundwork or only riding or, um, you know, non-contact with the horse and the horses are always free versus being able to catch and groom them. So no, that's wonderful that, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, those different methods were, were able to be captured and yeah, there's more than one way to do it. So that's wonderful. Absolutely. And like, so, so for, for me, say, for example, I'm, I'm an LMFT, right? Mm -hmm. Licensed surgeon family therapist. There's a range of things I could do with that, mm -hmm. right? And so if I do a session with someone for insurance reasons, I state what the interventions were, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it might not be the same depending on what the clients are. So I right. think in, in EFP, you're, I think that you're, what you're doing is the setting, right? You're outside, you're working with horses. Mm -hmm. It's that, it's, out, it's outdoor therapy. Um, and then what you're doing, that could be described in intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, like, are you, um, I'm just trying to think of like, um, you can say experiential, because like, if you were to look at 
um, just a standard um, like insurance form mm -hmm. of interventions you can use. You can say play therapy, experiential therapy, um, CBT, TSCBT, which is trauma focused uh, therapy, EMDR, mm -hmm. right? I think you could still be able to state that, like what you're doing mm -hmm. with understanding the setting is with horses. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a way that it can be broken down into code that makes sense and provides that flexibility, but also professionalism. Yeah. Right? That you are being professional about it. You're a licensed, you're trained or are becoming trained. Yeah. Um, and, and I think all of that, I think, can, can be worked out. Um, <laughs> and make more sense, I think, for people. Yeah. Um, and the, the other thing I'll say, too, is that in terms of, like, professional licensing certifications and stuff, um, people are always going to go by what their state is allowing them to do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important, too, for um, equine professionals um, be aware of what the licensure requirements are, what, what advertising especially. Yes. You know, like, what are you allowed to say, what you aren't allowed to say so you don't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea with that is not misleading the public, right? So just being very clear about if it's EFL, what does that mean? And just having one sentence, you know, or maybe two um, on your website or even on your card so people know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I always have to state licensed marriage and family therapist because that's my licensure it's not a licensed psychologist mm -hmm. so if someone could even write that you know like efl equine facilitating learning means this right led by a, a certified professional who's mm -hmm. not licensed by the state something like that just so it's clear clean um and and helps people understand what it is yes absolutely yeah that's that's the biggest thing with um you know i think it's it's done not intent or it's not intentionally done to mislead the public most times, but yeah, all Absolutely, things, right. you know, it's, we, we need to, um, you know, as a, an equine professional, that's not a, a therapist or a, a family and marriage practitioner license in that way. I'm certified, you know, being very open and transparent and owning my realm and what I do on the adaptive and the recreational side and letting you as the licensed professional own what you do on, on, in your world there and that we can mm -hmm. all work together on that. But we also need to yes. be transparent. And like you said, you know, be very clear because people on the outside, they don't know what these different terms mean. And we have to define them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, I want to throw one thing in there too, kind of related to um, um, in terms of the accessibility aspect of it, like the more well-known it becomes, um, uh, theoretically, it might become more affordable. Mm -hmm. I feel like right now horses are very expensive because yeah. it's rare. Right, it's treated more as a rare farm animal. Mm -hmm. uh, does not always have utility to it, but if it and forgive me, I think horses are great partners, spiritual allies. So when I say <laughs> this, if we think about the utilitarian value, yeah. if there's more demand because we can demonstrate that EFP works, mm -hmm. it might reduce the prices. Yes, that right? is very so good point, yeah. high demand, low prices. Right, so it might reduce the prices of horses might reduce the cost of certain things, mm -hmm. you know, theoretically, hopefully reduce the cost of property, but that we can't always control for that part to a certain degree. But just thinking about that too, that economically, mm. if we are able to demonstrate that this works and people are using it more, mm -hmm. it might help some of the prices uh, as well and become yeah. more affordable for people in our world. It's yeah. all theoretical, right. but just reading from an economic standpoint, that yeah, um, that's another motivational factor, I think, to provide clean research. Um, and clear de definition of terminology and methods yes. and, and what people are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very, very good point. So if people want to learn more about your research or if they have questions and they want to contact you, and um, this interview will be going out on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, my podcast channel as well. So I'll, I'll put everything, all your contact information in the comment section and also on the screen for the video options. But how can people get a hold of you if they have questions or would love to read over your, your dissertation? Absolutely. Um, email would be the best way. So the rrwaragoth.lmft at gmail.com mm -hmm. would be the best way. Um, and I have a really busy work schedule right now, but what would be great is if they do email me, we can set up a day or time to talk on the phone too, if it turns into wanting to connect deeper um, than just email exchanges. Um, so we can always arrange that. Um, and it, but also if someone wants to copy my, uh, my dissertation, just email me and I'm happy to send the PDF file to you for free. Okay. 
Perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wargoss, for, for joining in on this interview. And it's been so interesting to, to learn about your research. And thank you for all the wonderful information and um, you know, explaining the different research, too. I know that was kind of a, a toss-out question I didn't give you a heads up on, but I really appreciate no the, the wonderful explanation you gave. That was very easy to understand. Great. Thank you so much, Sabra. It was so nice to meet you and, and to talk about this stuff. Um, and thank you for the opportunity for me to share more about my, my dissertation and what I do.